Many people got lured into the crypto space because of they thought they could make huge returns here. But now that the token craze that started in 2014 has, uh, has sort of faded, faded away, has abated, the question that always comes up is how to make the most of the ongoing Web3 revolution. So on our panel today, we'll discuss risks, rewards, and strategies to make the most out of the space. And let me welcome heartily our four panel members who are doubtlessly qualified to talk about this. So on my left, we have Tim Bevan, founder and CEO of the ETC Group. Your company creates crypto exchange traded products that are physically backed and trade just like shares or ETFs. We have Peter Habermacher, CEO and founder of Aro Capital. Your company focuses on liquid fund of fund investing. Rudolf Siebel, you're responsible for legal and regulatory affairs, fund industry standards and market research at BVI, the German fund and asset management trade organization. And finally, we have Heno, Heno Henke, co-founder of Heartstocks. You're the first company in the EU to use blockchain to bring real-world assets to the market as fully regulated entities. So thank you all very much for coming. I told my panel members to be as aggressive and diverse and, uh, and combative as, as, they, as they want to. So let me start with a simple question. Why buy anything else than Bitcoin? Shouldn't you just buy Bitcoin and wait it out? Who wants to take that? Excellent idea. Um, yeah, I, look, I mean, the, the universe is quite rich and varied, um, but Bitcoin is still, you know, the, the lead asset within the space. Um, correlations are still quite high. So, I mean, again, we've heard this argument a few times, you know, why, why buy crypto? I just buy the NASDAQ. Or why look beyond Bitcoin? Or why look beyond Bitcoin Ethereum? Um, now, the real answer to that is the diversity. Right? If, you, if we look across the space now, the use cases and the types of protocol, I mean, just taking Bitcoin Ethereum, they are fundamentally different assets with very different um, valuation models uh, and functions in the market. So it kind of depends where you are on the curve, right? If you've gone down the rabbit hole, if you've begun to really understand the, the fundamental different nature of these protocols and have done enough research to have a view on which of these have a future and the problems they're going to address, then you can start taking you know, a, a varied view. Uh, if you're an early stage investor looking to make an initial allocation or just get exposure to crypto as an asset class, uh, then Bitcoin's an excellent proxy. Um, I'd argue that there's better ones, but it really depends on your, your risk appetite and what you're trying to achieve as an investor. Uh, so it, it kind of, the answer is yes and no, depending on who you are. Peter, what, what, what's your answer to that? Um, so he's, um, Tim's covered the kind of theoretical kind of angle of it. Um, at our capital, we often kind of look deeper into the numbers and is the theory kind of backed in natural data we see, um, given that we work with a number of top economic professors from UK universities. Um, and yeah, we very much kind of see that thesis of, Kind of diversification play out in the numbers. Um, our kind of uh, analysis, including kind of external analysis such as um, from Yale, from Vanek, um, show that there are meaningful diversification benefits from investing in a wider range of cryptocurrencies, both in terms of enhancing returns but also getting better risk adjusted returns. Any, you're dying to make a statement here. Of course I would like to. Uh, thank you, Wolfgang, for the kind introduction. I would say that the market and the technology offers so much more than crypto, because crypto is just one tiny field of the possibilities the blockchain offers to the market. And the market is, in the most spaces, so inefficient that the blockchain can solve a lot of the problems. For example, if you look at alternative assets, you have a really range, really broad range of problems and the blockchain can solve a lot of these problems. So crypto is just one aspect, the Bitcoin is one aspect of crypto and I would say the technology offers so much more that you should look over Bitcoin and see what the possibilities um, offer even more. 
rural viewpoint yeah, the uh, most the, the association member, obviously yeah. cannot uh, make statements on individual products or providers um, so, so we like everything and um, I think seriously as the first speaker said uh, it's a, a, all about investor preferences and diversification and the fund idea essentially is that you hold a pool of assets or in the crypto space would be then different crypto uh, currencies or other crypto assets in order to have a diversified portfolio which is uh, more resistant to shocks. Overall, obviously, from a fund industry perspective, the um, possibility to use either Bitcoin or other things is still limited. We only currently have in regulated funds in Germany the possibility to invest 20% of institutional funds in true crypto currency assets, native crypto tokens like Bitcoin, 80% should be tokenized securities in the traditional way. So that already opens up more to uh, investments in Web 3.0, for example, equity, and we come to that later. Tim, you want to add something to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, that's the key point. It depends on, on who the investor is and what they're trying to achieve and their risk appetite. Um, I mean, I would say the, the point about tokenization and the application of, of DLT technology, um, there's a danger here of being a futurist, and being a futurist is fine if you're willing to wait five, ten years, but if you're in, an investor, uh, you need addressable opportunities that are going to provide return over the next six, 12, 18 months. Uh, and whereas I would agree that the, the future is inevitably going to be the adoption uh, of DLT technology and tokenization, uh, across traditional markets and tokenization of real-world assets, uh, the time that's going to take in reality, I think, is a five to ten year time frame. And you know, the danger is that, that people get too excited too soon about the real speed at which this can happen, because the network effect required for everyone to start trading and holding tokens, it feels like we're a long way away from that. And as we know, central markets um, infrastructure providers are necessarily very conservative when it comes to new technology adoption. It has to be battle-tested for many, many years before uh, a CSD or a regulated exchange in the traditional world is going to adopt it. So whereas I agree the direction, uh, I think it's also very important to calibrate for speed. And there's always been the danger in this industry uh, of overexcitement and, and assuming things are going to move much faster than in reality they can. Peter. What is the economic case for crypto, blockchain, and Web3 anyway? Okay, so uh, we looked deeply into this uh, with our economic professors to come up with a kind of, yeah, a solid economic foundation using mainstream um, kind of modern economics um, as opposed to more kind of peripheral kind of economic theories um, and kind of yeah, essentially boils down to kind of blockchain and crypto can decentralize previously um, centralized processes um, and concepts such as money, value creation and value transfer, proof of ownership, um, creation of networks. So it's all about kind of, um, and this can really kind of, Im well, improve efficiency as well as kind of make things more democratic. Um, traditionally, you're kind of, beholden to kind of a network only, be that Amazon or Facebook um, or other kind of internet giant to essentially enforce the rules on their platform. This allows them to gain market power, which my background is economic consulting on competition economics, which um, kind of monopolies, market power is bad for consumers. Um, and so kind of a cryptocurrency in the absence of Someone who can enforce rules must make it beneficial for users to add value to these Web3 platforms, be this Ethereum, be this Solana, be this Cardano, but also make it expensive for them to kind of try and attack the network, trying to undermine the network. Um, and similar to traditional money, essentially the kind of role of a cryptocurrency on top of a blockchain is to incentivize economic activity in a more kind of democratic way essentially kind of the next we see as the next evolution of kind of capitalism taking kind of the concepts of yeah, free markets one step further but obviously there are limits of what can be done it takes time as it's already been covered on this panel 
I know, um, well, I'm not so sure that, uh, that all these aspects, technical aspects, will hold. In the end, I was attending yesterday a, a, a internal session with BaFin and, and Bundesbank and others, and um, I think the regulators will sort of try to rein in whatever they can. But on the other hand, that will add institutional security. Um, I think um, there's this famous video where uh, um, uh, people were asked 10 years, 20 years ago what, whether internet would be any way useful. I, I, my same approach is to Web 3.0 and, and, and DLT. It's there, there's a lot of money behind it, so it can't be a total stupid thing. So you better make sure that you get engaged in it, and we as an association obviously have to prepare for the future. I cannot determine, and I'm not, uh, as we are not in a state socialist planning economy, what my members are doing, but I have to make sure that my members can follow these streets. So we are clearly providing for changes in the regulation to address investment opportunities. For example, the new uh, the government will prepare, perhaps still in December, a law allowing for tokenized equity, um, which is currently a hindrance. Right now, um, tokenized Web 3.0 funds are a minority. In our own statistic, we have just one fund, which is administered by our member Hansa Invest. It's called BIT, Global Currency Leaders. It has 51 million investments in it. 86% of the investments are traditional equity and bond securities. 10% is tokenized crypto assets, maybe also so-called one-to-one certificates. That's the only way how you can buy Bitcoin into a fund currently. Uh, but that's clearly is a single investment Overall, Morningstar, which is the main data provider for traditional fund industry in Europe, provides for 500, um, excuse me, 620 million in sort of crypto asset related regulated funds, i.e. mostly equity funds. Rural, let me, let me pause you there. Uh, you, you're mentioning a lot of numbers and <laughs> I, I, I see that Eno is getting excited to, to chime in on the tokenization issue. I mean, you, you're on the business of tokenization. Um, I often hear the the argument it's it's going to make an asset class much more liquid as a key argument for tokenization. However, when I think about art or vintage cars, for example, I, I wonder, I, and I find it hard to imagine that people will trade their stakes more more more, more often than they than they would do if they had a direct investment. What's what's the point of of your company? Um, I would say it's not just about the trading. It's also about the structuring and creating new financial products that are more efficient than the traditional products on the market. So there are two steps. The first step is structuring products and afterwards you have the trading. And structuring products can also be more efficient if you use the blockchain in the right way. We are the first company that can structure financial products on equity basis using DLT technology. We have the equity companies that are on the DLT, so the ownership is divided by DLT. And so the structuring itself is way more efficient than the traditional way. And afterwards there's the trading infrastructure because Trading is always a part of how many people are exacted in the market. And um, actually right now there are not many places where you can trade a lot of tokens. It's always like a closed shop. So in the moment there are not many places where you can trade very efficient. But the market is developing. So there are a lot of spaces, a lot of companies that try to develop, like for example, the DLT pilot regime. And the marketplaces are growing even more. And... In the traditional way, you don't have any market infrastructure. You need to find one trading partner that gives you the price that you want, and that's it. And in a tokenized way, you can find like 100 or 1,000 people that buy a fraction of your share, a fraction of your investment. And so the accessibility and the possibility and the flexibility are way more higher if you tokenize an asset. But in the end, you always need a trading partner. So if you want to sell a share, you need someone to buy a share. And tokenization can solve the problem, but the infrastructure and the settlement processes can be way more efficient if you use DLT. Has there been any proof that tokenization of art or, or cars results in higher liquidity of the asset class at all? Or is the jury still out on that one? Mm, now yeah, if you see the market right now, if you have, for example, an art piece or a traditional car, 
what is the market for that? You need one trading partner that buys the whole asset. And for example, if you have an art piece and divide it into 1,000 or 100,000 shares, there will be transaction on the market in fractionalized ownership, for example. And so I would say the market is even more efficient even it's not that liquid as you would expect it to be, for example, if you buy a DAX share. You can sell it in seconds for no cost at all. So the big market and the big companies are efficient right now. But if you look at the other possibilities when you trade like art or cars, there is no liquidity at all on the market. It's so inefficient and the blockchain right now can offer solutions and there are a lot of companies, for example, hard stocks, that show you that it is possible already to fractionalize assets and to trade them on a secondary market. And liquidity, uh, uh, liquidity was first. Yeah, um, and also, well, enabling you to kind of break down kind of these um, kind of assets into smaller chunks also kind of widens the kind of the audience which you can potentially sell to. Obviously, kind of a more expensive RP to a car, only kind of large institutions can essentially afford to kind of buy uh, kind of the entire thing when you have fractionalization. Um, small investors can. Um, diversify kind of across, well, buy little pieces of a range of kind of these um, kind of more kind of exotic investments um, and so can then, um, well, we essentially have a larger kind of potential um, yeah, I mean, you, you don't need audience. You don't need tokens. We're talking about securitization, right? Fla fractionalization and securitization have been around for many, many years, right? The legal structures have existed for a long time. Uh, and I do find when people talk about tokens or tokenization, We've got to be specific as why do we want to tokenize it? What does what does the blockchain bring that securitization or existing means of fractionalization, which have been around for 20 years plus, bring to the party? It doesn't create liquidity out of thin air. That the real benefit of tokenization is that freely tra tradable aspect, right? The fact that you can you don't have to deal in a closed ecosystem or a centralized market. It can be freely traded. It, it is a, a fungible. Well, it, it is a non fungible. Um, uh, freely um, tradable instrument. But there's very few use cases that I've seen that actually want that level of decentralization, uh, either for practical reasons or regulatory reasons or tax reasons, etc. So that the real benefits of tokenization, I'm not disagreeing, um, but I do think it gets conflated. The idea that we can't securitize or we can't fractionalize without blockchain is a nonsense. We've been able to do it for many years. So I think we've got to work a bit harder in identifying the specific use cases that this technology brings and how to realize it. Um, it, it, it requires a bit more thought and a bit more development um, than, than just being this new thing that can do stuff that, frankly, we can already do. Mm, uh, uh, Order for first. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention um, in TreadFi, um, liquidity is coming not by itself. You see that if you look for crowdfunding, which has also been a recent development over the last 10, 15 years, also a regulated industry now, volumes are quite slow, small, low, because individuals usually do not devote so much liquidity to a single process. In the end, if you look at TreadFi, for example, bond markets, liquidity comes from market makers, i.e. larger institutions who are willing to make a um, portfolio which they hold for trading purposes in order to create liquidity. And that uh, is not solved by tokenization or yeah, any you, other technique. You need to commit capital and be exactly. able to commit capital and in order to have that. And that I think blockchain. that we also would need for a larger liquidity pool here. Obviously, uh, uh, smaller single or di double digit, maybe 100 million uh, Pockets of liquidity could be created, but I think if you look at large scale, like in bonds, where we regularly trade hundreds of millions uh, by a single of my members in a day, that is, uh, that is not possible without people committing capital here. Mm, I would partially agree because um, a few seconds ago you asked what is the purpose of the blockchain, and I would say in the financial market is always about reducing transaction costs that nothing else is the financial market. Make the market more efficient, reduce transaction costs, be more efficient. And the blockchain already can offer to make a lot of transactions more efficient. So, for example, liquidity comes always with trading infrastructure and participants on the market. Nothing else in the blockchain and tokenization doesn't solve the problem. So you always still need, as I already said, a trading partner. If you want to sell, you need someone to buy it and tokenization isn't solving the problem. But tokenization is solving a different problem. You can fractionalize shares and assets 
up to like a minimum scale of a euro or a cent as you want to and the transactions are way more efficient if you settle them over the blockchain so it's not always about liquidity itself that is developing with the market when the market is developing but it's about efficiency and efficiency can already be gained by using the transactions over the blockchain for example if you look on the traditional market a lot of assets that are structured as you said Tim that is be done like 20 or 30 years ever so um, the market does already structure assets, but the market is not efficient. So if you try to if you try to sell like um, an OTC marketplace for an alternative asset, you have like spreads up to 50, 60 percent. If you want to find one trading partner that is already possible, that buys your share. So and the blockchain offers a trading infrastructure that allows you not to buy uh, sell one part or one total uh, combined assets but for fractionalized asset over a very efficient infrastructure so not just liquidity but efficient marketplaces efficient settlement systems is like already existing and better than the old marketplaces that are quite used already so i would say it's not just liquidity but it's accessibility and efficiency uh, question to tim what do most investors in the crypto space get wrong or underestimate? Um, well, I can't speak for the whole industry. I can only speak for, the, for you know, the market we're geared up for. So, I mean, let's be honest. I'm actually a TradFi person who specializes in crypto assets, right? So we design products specifically for private banks, wealth managers, institutions. Um, and they're a tough nut to crack, right? They're, they're conservative and they're reasonably cynical when it comes to crypto, uh, and they've got high internal benchmarks to get through in, in, to be able to invest in, in crypto as an asset class. Um, and obviously the news flow uh, and events of 22 really didn't help um, the case. So, you know, big emphasis on, on security, uh, big emphasis on, on KYC AML, big emphasis on risk. You know, we get, everyone talks about returns or APYs. How do I measure risk in this market? Uh, it's very interesting to me being on a conference a few months ago. There was um, uh, a woman who was responsible for, for a reasonably large pension fund in Europe. And she said, yeah, eventually I, I will come into this market, but I think I'm two, three years away, because whereas I can measure the alpha, I can measure the risk of returns, this is relatively easy. How do I measure the operational risk of interacting with this market? How do I understand what risks I'm taking interacting with the infrastructure this market is built on? Very hard to do, uh, and frankly, I'm not even qualified to do it. So it's a huge lift. Uh, for a lot of institutions to really go down the rabbit hole and understand the ecosystem and analyze and price all the risks associated with it, liquidity, operational, credit, and, and, and. Um, so that's a huge challenge for people entering the market, and that's why we believe the ETP is a very natural access point, because you're solving a big chunk of those problems through the structure, uh, and you're solving the accessibility problem by putting it on traditional exchanges, uh, and you're providing a lot of certainty around certain aspects that are uncertain, uh, certainly to the institutional mind, when you try and interact with the, the crypto market directly. Uh, Rudolf, you, you have a lot of conversations with uh, uh, family fund offices and, and many other members of, of, your, of, your, of your corporation. Are family offices already there prepared to look at crypto investments? What's the feedback you're getting from the market? Um, actually, uh, so, uh, to clarify, our membership are fund, regulated fund managers. So for in legal parlance, AIF and usage managers and also IFD or MIFID firms. So as Tim said, TreadFi corporations, um, but not brokers. Um, so we do not offer trading to third parties. Um, obviously, our members represent both retail and institutional investors and the family office would f sort of more fall into the, the institutional uh, um, area. Um, we, our conversations are actually more with uh, small pension funds, insurance companies, may, maybe banks than family office. They still tend to be quite secretive. Uh, but the few we had is clearly they are more on the forefront of willing to look at these things because especially smaller regulated pension uh, institutions, pension funds, betriebliche Versorgungswerke in German parlance, um, as mentioned by Tim, have small teams 
then there are charged by their board or Aufsichtsrat with maybe looking into crypto because we already did gold and platinum, um, but now we do something else and they don't know whom to turn to, which broker to use in spite of being able to trade directly, but then I have no technical experience, so they would look for a partner, a broker. Then you look at the news, as Tim had explained, you essentially realize that the whole, not the technical infrastructure, which may be entirely secure, but the people around it are unregulated, maybe susceptible to fraud, and that goes up to the highest echelon, so that doesn't create institutional confidence, because remember this guy at the pension fund or the family office, if he commits five million to a trading platform, even just buying Bitcoin, and they just defraud it, and end off in Vanuatu, his job is on the line. So they will be very, very conservative in that respect, and we are not going to see to change that. And one thing which is really helping them right now, which is also hurting my membership, or, or in, in traditional assets, as well as in um, alternative assets, is simply interest are back. With interest rate at 4 to 5 percent, my members get even told, oh, get away with your offner immobile funds, your open-ended real estate funds. That is a bad sector. We don't want it. It's too complicated. We just go back to the good old uh, term deposit or something like that. Um, and that will also obviously create an additional barrier to all alternative assets, including crypto assets. Peter, your, your company focuses on, on fund of funds in, in the liquid space especially. Why did you pick that area? Why do you think it's a good venue for investors? Um, so there are many ways for professional and sophisticated investors to gain access to uh, this growth story. But the real challenge is to be, well, get exposure in a risk managed and dependable way. Direct investments are very time, resources, and expertise intensive. Uh, there are various kind of options in terms of, for example, Bitcoin funds, passive indexes, um, and also actively managed funds, each with their pros and cons. Um, the unique thing about this early stage inefficient market is the, the potential for outsized risk adjusted returns from effective active management is an order of magnitude larger than in traditional markets. So over the past um, five years, active managers have, on average, outperformed the crypto market by around 200%, with a third less volatility, half the maximum drawdown. But um, kind of the results and performance between different managers is massive. So only a small number of active managers can produce economically significant alpha. So it's all about being able to identify these managers, being able to assess the operational integrity of these managers, which is very different. So a crypto fund setup and operation is quite different to a traditional hedge fund. So you really need a specialist team of full-time people that have experience in this space to be able to do things in a properly risk-managed and dependable way. I, I know. What are the most exciting prospects for you in terms of products you would like to tokenize that haven't been possible in the in the past? And you're sort of a trailblazer because you're one of the first entities that allow the purchase tokenized purchase as as equity instead of just debt. Um, there are a lot of possibilities right now on the market, and a lot of things will come in the next few months regarding hard stocks. So I would say the most interesting part is like democratization of assets and to make alternative assets more efficient. As I said, if you buy a DAX share, it's efficient. You can trade it via Trade Republic for Euro 24-7 for no cost at all, and the market is efficient. But the alternative assets are quite inefficient, but the market is quite interesting because the interest rates are high, the returns are high, the assets are quite interesting for a lot of people, and you can identify with these assets. But a lot of people don't have access, and these marketplaces are quite inefficient. So, for example, if you look at private equity infrastructure, um, small and medium-sized companies, you don't have the access as a retail investor or even as a professional investor with like limited funds. You don't have accessibility to these markets and if you have accessibility, the market is quite inefficient. So Hardstocks is aiming to solve these problems and we want to aim at all these alternative assets to make them more efficient as long as the asset is quite good and the asset manager is interesting and reliable we are able to make these assets more efficient as a financial market product based on equity based on the blockchain and so like as i said everything in the alternative market is right now the aim of hard stocks 
Tim, what, what would it take to make people more comfortable with investing in crypto? Well, a, a sustained period without a bad thing happening would be a nice start, um, which we've just about achieved in, in 23. We, we are allowed to dream on this panel. Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, <laughs> markets have short memories, but not that short, right? So after the events of 22, um, the, the biggest fix is time. Uh, and you know, there, there are much more sensible heads in the room now. Uh, we, we see much more grown-up ways of addressing governance, uh, regulation, and the market's infrastructure on, on, on which this has to be built if you're ever going to turn it into an institutional market. Uh, and without institutions, crypto will die. So, you know, we have to embrace regulation. We, we have to learn the good lessons from TradFi about risk, about governance, about conflicts of interest. Uh, and we have to combine the knowledge base of the two worlds to, 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 to produce something inherently better and more efficient and realize um, th those potentials. So I think all of that's happening. Um, I think as well people need more points of reference. So what is an eligible crypto? What isn't? How do I separate the noise from investable instruments? Um, what is a clean price? You know, benchmarks. It pegs to hang uh, a framework on so I can go into an investment committee and demonstrate that this is an investable asset class that is meaningful and adult um, and we can actually deploy capital to it. So whether that's index providers, data providers, uh, new regulated venues, uh, new types of investment products, uh, hopefully with MICA regulatory framework coming in uh, that we can all start to contextualize this market within, it's all pointing towards um, you know, decent institutional participation over the next 12, 18 months, and I'm a huge believer that'll be the case. Then it's a question of how do they want to interact with the market? And again, you know, we would argue the ETP is, is the perfect access point uh, if you want to start allocating to crypto, but without making a big investment into infrastructure uh, and, and risk management and deepening internal knowledge, uh, then this is a very convenient way to take the first steps on that journey. It may be over time then that the, that the passive ETP is, is, is too inflexible uh, and I want to take a more activist or, or, or deeper participation into the crypto market but that could be a second third step so it's all moving the right way uh, and as I say I think you know we, we see a lot of anecdotal evidence that that institutional participation will become a big feature uh, over the next 12 18 months yeah I mean as you said ETP ETFs so the exchange trade obviously are additional costs I agree with that but that is sort of the cost for being able to access the market easily and to buy into a trusted structure. So it's essentially an insurance premium which you are paying if you want to be in right now um, in order to have that available. Uh, but it's still a, it's a small market. I mean, we're talking about 620 million alone in BVI equity funds. In uh, We have over 100 billion in cl classic tech equity. So. Uh, don't get fooled. We need the DLT pilot being implemented, at least in parts, to have some references. We need the MICAR. Because in the end, what people now realize is that all the mistakes and all the frauds happening in threat file securities markets are simply repeated here. Front running, all other kinds of defrauding of people. So, uh, so I was raised since 2008 that regulation, we are overdoing regulation, it's too much, and that's true, especially on the reporting side, but on the other side, you really now need to appreciate, looking backwards in, at these experience, how much trust securities markets regulation is creating. And that's not about technology, that's simply about people behaving, because behind each DLT application, there are people who are offering it, people who are selling it, and people who are making money of it. And if these people are, cannot be trusted, your money is going away, not on the chain, but because of these people. And that's the problem we need to fix. And therefore, I fully agree with Tim about this big bouquet of flowers we need to make this work. And one part is um, having a regulation of the individuals in place so that they can be trusted. We're nearing the, the end of our panel. Peter, in 30 seconds, what, in your view, would it take to revive this market, to revitalize the, the, uh, the current crypto feeling that we're in a, in a winter? Is it just the Bitcoin price? Um, in short, yes. <laughs> um, so kind of 
uh, bull market is normally kind of uh, born out of kind of an air of kind of disbelief, um, not because of new demand coming in, but because um, everyone who's lost kind of faith in the market is essentially sold when there's yeah, not enough. Uh, you essentially have a supply squeeze, and that's what normally, um, kind of technically, what drives the beginning of bull market, and that's exactly the dynamics where that we're seeing on chain right now. Kind of crypto Ethereum are the most illiquid they've ever been, and now we're seeing signs of that uh, supply squeeze forcing up, forcing up price. Any, you get to make the last statement. In ten years from now, if you were right to, if you were to write a press release on what has happened to tokenization of real-world assets. What would the headline be? Dreams came true and hard stocks won. Um, so now I would say like the technology will e develop even faster than we think and a lot of big companies right now are aiming at these possibilities. So I think in 10 years from now, a big part of the market will be tokenized and the structuring will be done by blockchain, the settlement process will be done by blockchain and tokenization will be the main infrastructure to the financial market in 10 years. Gentlemen, thank you very much for the discussion. Thank you.